At first glance, this sounds like a joke or a piece of propaganda. But in North Korea, trucks powered by firewood actually exist and are still in use today. In this video, we look at why the country ended up making such choices and revisit the history of wood gas vehicles, a rare and forced technology that different countries have turned to during critical moments in their history. It makes sense to start with how a gas generator actually works. First, let's clarify one thing right away. A vehicle running on wood is not a steam engine without rails. Steam-powered cars with their separate fireboxes, boilers, and complex expansion systems remained a technological curiosity. Their low efficiency and bulky design left them behind fairly quickly. A gas generator vehicle works on a different principle. At its core, it still uses a conventional internal combustion engine. The gas generator does not replace the engine. It serves as a unit that produces combustible gas, which is then burned in the engine's cylinders instead of gasoline. In practice, these vehicles usually did not abandon liquid fuel entirely. Most gas generator cars were capable of operating on gasoline as well. Producer gas is a mixture composed primarily of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. It is obtained by burning tightly packed wood under conditions of limited air supply. This simple principle is what automotive gas generators are based on, a system that is straightforward in concept, but bulky in practice and dependent on a number of auxiliary components. Gas generator vehicles saw their widest use during the First and Second World Wars, when acute gasoline shortages made alternative solutions a necessity. They were also used in remote areas, in Siberia and the Taiga in particular where vehicles were employed in logging operations and where delivering fuel by tanker trucks or rail was simply impossible. However, the system had inherent drawbacks. Producer gas burned poorly, as a large portion of it consisted of inert nitrogen, with roughly another quarter made up of carbon monoxide. To make the mixture combustible, it had to be further diluted with air, which reduced its energy content even more. As a result, engine output dropped noticeably when operating on wood gas. There were other disadvantages as well. The gas generator equipment was bulky, required constant maintenance, and offered a very limited driving range. Still, these shortcomings were offset by one key advantage, autonomy. In conditions of fuel scarcity, or even complete absence of gasoline, vehicles could continue operating. In essence, a gas generator system functioned as a small refinery that the vehicle carried with it, using fuel that was effectively free. Over time, however, this advantage lost its relevance. Post-war Europe and the world more broadly gradually recovered, fuel shortages faded, and expanding networks of gas stations made heavy and cumbersome gas generator systems unnecessary. The discovery of oil fields in Siberia, along with the development of railways and highways, made it possible to deliver fuel even to regions that had previously been inaccessible. As a result, by the late 1950s, gas generators had almost completely disappeared from vehicles worldwide. During that period, fuel supplies in North Korea were also relatively stable. At the same time, North Korea was never an energy self-sufficient country and, from the moment it was founded, depended on external supplies. To understand how serious this dependence was, it is enough to note that the country did not even have its own oil refining industry. As a result, it relied not simply on crude oil, but on supplies of gasoline diesel fuel, and lubricants. Until the late 1980s, this situation remained relatively stable thanks to the socialist bloc, above all the Soviet Union. It is easy to assume that the Soviet Union sold fuel to its North Korean ally at reduced prices. Not quite. In fact, not at all. The Soviet Union supplied petroleum products mainly through barter because North Korea did not have the means to buy fuel even at preferential prices. At times, there was nothing to offer even for barter and fuel and lubricants were shipped on credit. Those credits were never repaid. In addition to the Soviet Union, China also supported the North Korean economy with petroleum products, largely under the same arrangement. This system lasted until the collapse of the Eastern Bloc and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Russia, transitioning to a market economy and facing a severe crisis of its own, largely ended fuel deliveries to North Korea on preferential terms. Market prices were simply out of reach. There was no way to pay. Around the same time, China was carrying out its own economic reforms and also stopped supplying free fuel. For North Korea, the consequences were severe. 
agriculture was almost completely paralyzed by the lack of diesel fuel, while domestic reserves were minimal. In an agrarian country, this led not to a shortage, but to a famine, which North Korea fell into in the mid-1990s. It was for this reason that the country was forced to return to the long-forgotten technology of gas generators, and the conversion of trucks was put on a mass scale. Priority was given, first of all, to military vehicles, and only then to agricultural equipment. The basic operating principle of the gas generator had not changed over the years. The same sealed furnace mounted in the truck bed, and the same stoker working there. While the vehicle was moving, he chopped wood into chips and kept feeding it into the fire. As a result, a North Korean wood gas truck required two people to operate it, one behind the wheel and another working in the cargo bed. Beyond the already mentioned drawbacks, such as the loss of engine power, this technology had another serious side effect. Engines running on wood gas had to be torn down and rebuilt fairly often. The combustible gas, essentially dirty smoke, was so contaminated that no filters could fully protect the engine from heavy carbon buildup. On top of that, gas generator trucks handled cold weather poorly, and the mountainous terrain common in North Korea made their operation even more difficult. For these reasons, even the large-scale introduction of gas generators did little to improve the overall situation. With traditional fuel almost entirely unavailable, slow, unreliable trucks that had lost a significant share of their power simply could not fill the gap. Transport never returned to pre-crisis levels, and moving people and goods over long distances remained a serious challenge. Conditions in agriculture were even worse. This sector depends on reliable, high-torque machines capable of working continuously throughout the day, something gas generator systems could not provide. Tractors and combines also proved poorly suited to gas generator installations. Over time, a certain degree of stabilization did take place in the agricultural and food sectors. Still, calling it a real recovery would be an exaggeration. There was no rebound and no growth. Fuel shortages never went away. The economy simply adjusted to a lower standard of living, or more accurately, to widespread poverty. People adapted to living with constant shortages of almost everything. Whatever limited fuel the authorities managed to secure was allocated first and foremost to the military. Under these conditions, agricultural workers had little choice but to shift toward manual labor, animal traction, and further reductions in mechanization, developments that did nothing to help the country emerge from its prolonged crisis. Another limiting factor was the near total lack of hard currency and the inability to purchase fuel abroad. North Korea never managed to build its own oil refining industry, which meant it could not import relatively cheap crude oil and instead had to rely on far more expensive refined petroleum products. At the same time, the country continued to follow an ideology of self-reliance. To outside observers, it may seem ironic, but for North Koreans, it was not an abstract slogan. The ideology of self-reliance was a concrete system of beliefs that explained why the country chose to live worse, but independently. It was built around a set of core principles. The ideology of self-reliance is the belief that the state must rely only on its own resources, minimize dependence on the outside world, be willing to sacrifice living standards for the sake of independence, view external dependence as a threat to sovereignty, At first glance, all of this sounds quite reasonable. What could be wrong with self-reliance and independence? The problem was that behind this rhetoric, there was very little to support it. North Korea did not possess significant mineral reserves, a solid resource base, or an industrial sector capable of delivering what was proclaimed in the ideas of Juche. North Korean ideology can be reduced to a simple formula, survival at any cost, even at the price of degradation. The state operated according to the logic of a besieged fortress, where the survival of the regime took priority, while the country's reputation and the living standards of its population were secondary. At the same time, it would be wrong to say that North Korea completely rejected foreign trade. At various points, it attempted to establish economic ties, including with Western countries. The problem lay elsewhere. In exchange for goods and technologies, North Korea had almost nothing to offer. In theory, Loans could have been an alternative, but over time, most countries preferred not to do business with North Korea. This was not always the case. A telling example is the story of the Swedish Volvo deal. In the 1960s and 1970s, 
North Korea was not yet isolated in the way it is today. The country actively sought Western technologies, tried to present itself as a normal state, and experimented with international trade. The deal with Sweden was driven by more than economic considerations alone. Sweden was a neutral country and had a reputation as a bridge between different political systems. Swedish Volvo cars were also known for being reliable and durable. The contract included the delivery of 1,000 Volvo 144 vehicles, along with machine tools, equipment, spare parts, and technical documentation. The total value of the deal was estimated at 650 million Swedish kroner, or roughly 70 million U.S. dollars at the time. From the Swedish perspective, the risks appeared limited. North Korea was considered solvent, no sanctions were in place, and the country already had some experience trading with Western partners. On the Swedish side, all obligations were fulfilled. The cars were manufactured and delivered to North Korea. After several payments, however, the flow of money stopped. The North Korean side cited economic difficulties and external circumstances. Negotiations followed, but they led nowhere, and payments ultimately ceased. Formally, this debt is still listed against North Korea today. With accumulated interest, the total amount is now approaching $1 billion. At the same time, the Swedish side has neither effective mechanisms nor real leverage to recover the money. It is therefore unsurprising that, after this episode, few countries were willing to engage in serious economic dealings with North Korea. Notably, some of the Volvo cars supplied by Sweden can still be seen on the streets of North Korea today, despite their age and the near total absence of spare parts. In 2006, following North Korea's nuclear tests, sanctions were imposed by most Western countries. These measures further aggravated an already difficult situation. It is important to note that sanctions were not the cause of the crisis, but they did make it significantly worse. Around the same period, the fuel situation in North Korea began to improve gradually. China became the main supplier, effectively providing fuel at its own expense. For Beijing, this was a necessary cost. A way to prevent a complete collapse in North Korea, avoid a potential refugee flow, and maintain a buffer zone along its borders. Today, gas generator trucks have almost completely disappeared from Pyongyang and other major cities. The current fuel situation has made it possible to abandon them in urban areas. They are no longer used by the military either, which remains the top priority for the North Korean authorities. However, in the provinces, gas generator trucks can still be encountered, even if far less frequently than in the past. According to the few tourists who have seen such vehicles on North Korean roads, locals react very negatively to attempts to photograph them. They likely understand that this is not something to be proud of.